uh, the biggest issue is just the him being aggressive with the neighbor dogs, especially mm -hmm. whenever they charge over. Yeah. So, um, but that <coughs> situation has a tendency to stem from a bigger from a bigger issue, and the issue is interpersonal, um, and it's usually interpersonal between the dog and the owner whenever um, whenever we have that protective instinct, and and, and it's easy to hyper focus on the event that happened you know mm -hmm. because you said that there was an attack i mean and, and, and that's not to be disregarded mm -hmm. you know like it's an important thing but when it comes down when it comes down to it the fix going forward is, is to make sure that we have the, the proper the the, he, the the dogs have the proper understanding of mm -hmm. the relationship between themselves and you um because that right there can can end up changing the way that the dog thinks about it is uh, because at this point hey, blah, blah. Um, at this point he has the the idea that you know it can be his job to protect the place mm -hmm. you know and now as far as I'm concerned and I don't know exactly how you feel about this but as far as I'm concerned if he protecting the place when you're not here is fine Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, like that's part of why we have dogs. You know, it's just they look after the place whenever we can't. Right. Um, but in the in the instances that you are here and you're out with him and things of that nature, we don't want him to think that he that it's his job to protect you. That you that he needs to look to you for guidance first mm -hmm. before he goes into those situations. Right. And now once we can achieve that, then we move forward by exposing him to more and more dogs until he can start to generalize that dogs in general are usually friendly. You know, like they're usually a good thing. And it's not something that we need to that we need to get all stirred up about every single time. So we, whenever we get the opportunity, we will take that. But so that's that's the idea. Is, is if we establish the hierarchy of uh, of um, you know position, right. the dogs understand that very clearly. It's not a it's not a difficult thing. This is like what a dog is always going to assume that whoever the strongest being is. Now, that strong doesn't necessarily have to do with physical strength. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the. Uh, it, it's more of an energy. A strength of energy, you know, and a strength of uh, in in the fact that whenever I, you know, if I'm the if I'm the strong person, if I decide that something is going to be done or something is not going to be done, then I have the ability to call on whatever tools I have and enforce that my will is the one that goes forward, and that's a good thing. I mean, it sounds, you know, the language sometimes sounds a little bit uh, like we're trying to. Uh, trying to oppress or something like that, and that's by no means the case. It's just and that pit bull attacked him. Mm -hmm. He didn't fight back. He didn't fight back. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, he was just trying to get away from him. Right. Well, a lot of times that'll happen. But it, now he's now he's doing preventative work. Exactly. Is whenever somebody comes in, right? He puts his his show on mm -hmm. right from the get go to try and keep them at a distance. And that generally comes from the insecurity of not knowing how this is going to turn out mm -hmm. if it gets bad. Right. Um, incidentally, the the confident dogs are usually the least aggressive. You know, because if you think about it, in this situation, what happened was is he was living a normal, confident life. I feel good about everything. Nothing mm -hmm. is pretty much a threat to me. I'm, you know, I'm a... I'm a perfectly safe in all of my environment and then all of a sudden something comes in and disrupts that idea right and so a lot of people want to uh, attribute uh, aggression to confidence that like the more confident dog is the more aggressive and that's absolutely 100% wrong it doesn't it doesn't work that way the dog that ends up having aggressive behavior is always the one that is the least confident and what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep the danger at a distance. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it is, they're trying to keep their fear away. Um, so when dogs are in a pack, they always have they always have a, a, a structure. You know, as far as they have they have somebody who's in charge, at least one right. who is in charge, and then the rest the rest of them have a tendency to be subordinate and they do that and they do that for a good reason is the the one that's in charge is generally the 
most competent of the group. I mean, whether it be physically, whether it be decisions, whether it be um, hunting ability, I don't, I don't know exactly how each, you know, each one of them will have their own distinction, but very often it is the physical presence. Uh, and and probably 95% of the time, and the reason for that is, is because dogs come pre-programmed with the information that the strong one is the one that decides when we fight. The strong one is the one who's responsible for protecting us. And the same kind of thing is inherent in, in us as people as well, um, because, I mean, it was the same thing when, um, when a big banker takes a gigantic salary for cutting 50,000 people's jobs, you know, and then they, and, they, and they give them a big bonus over it, you know, because they saved the bank a bunch of money and everything. We inherently know as human beings that is wrong, because whoever's up the top, it's their job to sacrifice for the pack, you know, for the group. Right. And um, and we, so we know that that's not the proper way of being, and that's why it upsets us. But you know, if if we wanted to give Mother Teresa a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar bonus, then or two hundred and fifty million dollar bonus and everything, nobody would have any problems with that, you know, or, or something, you know, anybody like that. Now, of course, this I'm um, just to be just to be clear, this is uh, I'm repeating pretty much verbatim something that uh, a guy named Simon Sinek said, mm -hmm. um, but. That's still the concept is, is that the dogs come with the knowledge that this, the strong one is the one that makes the decisions. It's the one that chooses when to fight. It's also the one whose responsibility it is to watch out and keep guard. And so it, and now that, that structure, that dominance essentially is something that changes from moment to moment, you know, because if you get up and leave, then all of a sudden, now you you can't be the dominant one if you're not present, mm -hmm. and so therefore it has to fall to somebody else. And that's where a dog protecting the property whenever you're not away or whenever you're not here is not really a problem mm -hmm. um, because they're the only one that can make the decision. And we would we would love if they made the one that we would make all the time, but you know there's only so much you can do about that. It's, yeah. uh, if if some strange dog wants to come in while you're while you're away. And they're out left roaming the property, then you know we 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 just have to trust their decision making, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so the idea is, is we want to achieve that position. And now dominance is not. Um, I mean, I know I carry around a, a big staff, you know, all the time. But dominance is not a matter of uh, you know like physical confrontation. It doesn't have to be that. I mean, like whenever we put on that particular collar and we put on the leash and you got to the point to where you can just barely hold the leash and move with him and he moves just fine without any sort of resistance he's not pulling on the mm -hmm. leash he's not doing any of that stuff you're able to express your competence or your dominance which are almost interchangeable just because you have the proper tools and he's willing to give in earlier than you are willing to give in by a good margin and so that little conversation right there ends up being something that when you get to the point where you can say hey this is what i want to do and then it happens each time then you are the one in charge and then those ability those uh, responsibilities of protection get passed on to you and so then it's your job to protect until you get to the point that you can't do it so if somebody were to come in and 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 become a, a problem and everything to you and you were not able to handle that or you even showed that you weren't going to be able to handle that then the dog can still continue to do what a dog does mm -hmm. and, and keep an eye on you and protect you but what we want is we want that to not happen until until we, uh, until it's time right you know so we just go through regular obedience processes and and learn some tasks and learn to manage the dog and manage them on a very on a fairly tight basis for a little bit just to dispel this idea that he could be the the dominant you know animal around here and once that is done then they look they relax they let they let go of this need to protect and they drop it off uh, and then you don't end up having the same amount of you know the same amount of uh, risk towards aggressive behavior and so we just got to figure out how to do that, which I can help you out with, obviously. Okay. That's why I'm here. Um, so when we're talking about dogs, we have three primary principles that we use in dog training. Um, first one is motivation. So we have to motivate dogs in a positive and a negative way, which I think that you're on board with. And 
we need to make sure that we understand what is positive and negative to this particular dog because there's I mean especially with like Labrador type dogs um, some of them are just so happy-go-lucky all of the time mm -hmm. that you can't hardly offend them and in that situation that becomes a uh, that 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 becomes a little bit of a hassle i mean even and it is, it's a shame because the puppy is just you know a dog is just being happy and loving life mm -hmm. and everything and sometimes that becomes a problem we have to curtail that i mean just in the same way as if you run into a manic person they can cause a lot of trouble and i know because i've been that person before <laughs> you know we had a one of ill's old buddies well mm -hmm. long old buddy but anyway he uh his garage door was open and he came the dogs were barking and so I went out he was in the garage and the dogs Winston and Winston got on one side of me Rusty got on the other side of me mm -hmm. and they sat there on, and just kind of told that guy we better not be hurting her right you know and um, so then I told him once I told him it was okay then they went ahead and well, and that, okay with them. that's great. Yeah. Like that's the kind that that's definitely the kind of that's the the check in mm -hmm. that we were talking about where right. the dogs show up mm -hmm. and they show up. They say, hey, here I am. I'm, you know, I'm ready to, I'm ready to be whatever it is you need me to be, boss. You know. Right. But they are acknowledging that you're the boss, mm -hmm. and so that's the kind of thing that we definitely want to, to, um, further. Um, so. We want to make sure that we can tell the dogs what it is that we want them to do, obviously, um, with positive reinforcement. We also want to be able to tell the dogs what we don't want them to do with negative discouragements, <coughs> essentially. And um, now that has to be particular to each dog, because what this dog finds offensive is not necessarily going to be the same thing as what that dog finds offensive in that one. Um, I actually was coming in whenever they got through the gate, I went and you know, and you try to use the stick to block the little one, and you can see that he gives a little bit of he, he gives a little bit of space to the stick, and he he's willing to he's willing to to give, mm -hmm. you know, to give to the pressure. And the little one had no idea of it. No. <laughs> no, just like tried to push right through it, and was just like either this is an inconvenience that this thing is in my way, you know, <laughs> and and just tried to push right on through. Yeah. And, and it's funny because the littlest dog was the, you know, in that situation, the one feeling the most pushiness. Yeah. You know, which isn't abnormal at all, but no, she it's funny. thought you came to visit her. Right. So, yeah. So, um, so what, we just want to make sure that we understand that in order for a correction of any sort to be a correction, the dog actually has to find it corrected. It's not one of those things where I find it offensive, and so therefore it is a correction. We don't get to make that judgment because we're not the one receiving it. Um, and we're not the one that it is affecting as far as our, you know, uh, it's not affecting our behavior, it's affecting the behavior of the dog. And so we need to be willing to go to wherever it is that we need to go. But that generally, we don't want to go too far either, you know, because there's problems on both ends. If mm -hmm. you don't go, if you, if you don't give enough pressure to a dog, then the, then the dog becomes emboldened and, and tends to push through you. Mm -hmm. If you give too much pressure, then the dog tends to have very bad attitude about it. Has you know ends up in adding to their fear and uh, and also some perhaps some resentment. But although dogs don't carry a huge amount of resentment, they don't really have the equipment for it as much as we do. Some, but not not much. So, um, like my dog Cinch. His favorite game in the world is the, that we play, the one that's out in the car, is mm -hmm. I punch him in the face. Oh. And that sounds to the average person like a horrible thing, and how could that possibly ever be okay? <laughs> Cinch finds it amazing, but he's a cattle dog that's ready to get kicked in the head by cattle and still oh. want to keep working. And so it's not, it's not a problem for him. And so we treat him as an individual, find out where his thresholds are. And apply those things because if, I mean, if it gets to the point that he does something wrong, give him the the similar little pop in the mouth like like we do, and everything like that, then he's going to get really excited and think, oh well, if I do this behavior that I don't actually want, but if I do this behavior that dad dad apparently wants it because whenever he does, he plays with me, mm -hmm. you know, because that's just how that dog plays, and so we need to we need to be uh, willing to accept that the same thing isn't doesn't affect each. You know, each being the same, each dog the same. Um, 
like whenever it comes to you know getting up and moving around that little dog like if I want to shoo them out of a space that little dog is going to be very much less perturbed by the by me getting up and moving it whereas this one right here might have a little bit more of a problem with it because it takes a lot more energy for him to get up and move so anyway not to belabor that point same thing goes with the positive some dogs don't even like affection obviously you don't have that issue with him you know rusty <laughs> likes no. his affection and so when we have that we want to use that as a tool we also tend to use food as a training uh, implement to help them encourage them in different things um, but we want to understand that there's a difference in application between the two. That food does a very different thing than affection. Um, so whenever you're using food as a reward, what food does is it activates your dopamine, which none of this stuff is super important, but to get the, the, the background of it, the dopamine is the same thing that when you eat food makes you happy. You know, it's that it's that pleasure chemical that makes you want to go eat more, you know, eat more food. It's the same thing that um, alcoholics and addicts and stuff like that have whenever they use whatever substance they use is that it um, causes a pleasure chemical to make you want to go back and do it again. And it is responsible for addiction. So we actually can use that. But it was given to us in the very beginning so that we would continue to feed ourselves. Because if we stop eating, we actually get less hungry the longer it goes after the first you know three four or probably five six seven eight hours after that first initial period once the hunger drops down then it gets to the point to where they um your hunger actually drops over time and that's how people are able to do long fasts and stuff like that so now the important thing that dopamine does is it helps you also to get food it teaches it teaches the brain how to recognize things that produce food and so it helps them to remember actions and that's the key takeaway from this whole thing is food will help a dog to remember an action and the other benefit from it is food also helps them to feel more positive about certain things so if I come into a situation and like say um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good example. You know, say somebody's say somebody's uh, afraid of elevators. You know, it scares them. If you go in and you're, um, they, you find out what their favorite food is, and you prevent them from having it anywhere else, the only place that they can have it is in the presence of an elevator. And then later on, they have to eat it in the elevator, and eventually they can only eat it when the elevator's moving. Then what it does is it, it starts to change the brain to where when the brain sees, sees elevator, it thinks of the favorite food instead of this metal box of scariness, you know, that a lot, you know, sometimes people have trouble with. And so we can use food to change the attitude of a certain thing. So if the dog is in a situation where another dog is present and that makes them super nervous and anxious and negative feeling and everything we can actually change that to where we add food and especially a high value food to the situation in the presence of the other dog so that so your dog starts to think that other dog being here is a, is a time to go check in with mom and dad because they might be giving me cut up hot dog or something which is incidentally what i'm what, what we're going to use today um cut, uh, hot dogs actually are quite a bit better for dogs because they're filled with all of those things that we don't really want to eat but dogs definitely do want to eat you know and they don't get in their diet as much anymore so um, so we can use that to add a positive spin to an activity that may be negative you know so we can reward them with that um, now physical affection does something very different and it says to the dog I it says to the dog I like the energy that you have Whenever you pet a dog, especially if you pet it with the similar kind of energy, if you're happy about a nice, calm energy that you have, you know, and luckily you have some pretty calm dogs in general, and you're petting them with that calm energy, then, number one, if you're the stronger being, they will seek to reach the energy that you have. They'll seek to become the same kind of energy. And so if you're calm, they'll try to become calm. If you ruffle them up, and you're the strong, you know, like you're the dominant creature and everything, then they will get excited to your energy, you know. Um, and, but it's it's often telling them that I like that I'm giving you affection with the energy that you have. 
and that's the way that they feel about it. So if you have a dog that is acting in a way that is is causing, you know, is being stressed out and stuff, then the if you're petting it in that moment, then what you're doing is, is you're adding fuel to that energy that they have. And a lot, that's where a lot of people start making mistakes. They'll try to calm the dog down, which does work in the moment, but it also tells the dog that whenever I become aggressive, then mom comes over and pets me for it. Mm -hmm. You know, which is incidentally, if we're if we're going if we're going to if we're trying to create uh, protection dogs or uh, or defensive dogs or something like that, defensive dogs are the ones that are trying to bark people away mm -hmm. and put off a lot of nasty energy so that people will stay away, and that's called defensive work. And whenever we're doing that, we absolutely can pet the dog through the whole process. And the more we do that, the generally the more it will fuel that energy because we're basically telling the dog we're happy with it for the energy that it has you know um, and a lot of people are trying to use that calming down idea to help their dog to not do that so we need to be very careful not to do that anymore if the dog's being aggressive or um, or having any sort of problem like that having some sort of an attitude that we don't like an energy that we don't like and we don't want to pet the dog at all we don't want to give them any sort of physical touch mm -hmm. that is not that is con that could be confused as positivity and so that's a super important thing um so that basically takes care of motivation um positives and negatives it has to be specific to the dog also needs to be specific to the situation because what a dog finds positive in one situation might not be the same in another so the higher the energy the more important the the more important the the treat needs to be in order to get the dog's attention also, the more the, the more important the correction needs to be to get the dog's attention. So if you come to a dog, like I mean, if I came to a dog and I wanted them to give you some space, I can do this little situation right here, very gentle, and he gives space. And that's a, that's a correction. I mean, like you call it correction. It's some sort of a dissuasion mm -hmm. of pushing him away. But if I use that same amount of energy and that same amount of pressure while he was trying to attack my dog's inch outside, then it would not work at all. Mm -hmm. So when the situation becomes more intense, then the corrections generally need to become more intense in order to be effective. And um, same things, the rewards need to become higher in order to be valuable because uh, somebody, you know, somebody wants to give me a dollar, I'm going to take it every time, you know. But if they want to interrupt me and give me a dollar while I'm in the middle of a fist fight, I don't care. Just get away from me. I've got more important things to handle right now. You know, I mean, and that's the same kind of thing that we want to think about with the dog. So, after that, uh, we talk about the principle of timing. Dogs only have 1.3 seconds to associate cause and effect. So, if you are happy with the dog for something or you are displeased with the dog for something, they need to know what it is that you're happy or displeased about. So, they don't understand the words, at least not yet. You know, not until we make sure that we teach them. But they don't really understand time much at all. They live in a in, in very momentary uh, life. They live just moments at a time. And so if you end up getting upset or frustrated with the dog for something that they did a minute and a half ago, the dog's not going to figure it out. Very, very likely not going to figure it out. They can after some time, after a lot of repetition when it happens a whole bunch, but it's not reliable. And so they're going to assume very strongly that whatever it is that you're happy about right now has to do with what's happening right now. And same thing with corrections. If they do if they do something if they do something a while back and you try to correct it for that, then they're going to assume that you're correcting it for whatever they're doing at that moment. So if the dog gets in the trash can while you're away, you come home and the dog's laying on the couch and you pull the dog off to off the couch to the trash can and say no 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 or whatever then the dog thinks that you were upset with him for being on the couch and you're using the trash can to punish him. Oh. Right. So when we have those confusions between us and our dog on what it is that we're feeling and what it is that we're um, trying to communicate to him, uh, then those then things get out of whack pretty quickly because the dog we, we assume that the dog can understand more than it can understand. Um, so if we know how to tell them what's good, we know how to tell them what's bad, you know, what we want and what we don't want. And we know when to tell them so that they can actually understand it. So it's inside of that 1.3 seconds. Then the last piece, the last principle is just consistency. 
if we can continue to wander around and micromanage things, dogs will eventually notice that every time I go to do this particular activity, I'm being obstructed. I'm being blocked from that. Every time I go to do this activity, I'm encouraged. And so they'll, they can understand that, hey, you know, like these things are things that I'm not allowed to do. These things are things that I, that I am allowed to do. And I want to keep my life going as smoothly as possible. And so if mom's always going to correct me whenever I go to one place, then I'm just going to avoid doing that. And the mom never corrects me for it. And so we do that consistently. And honestly, not giving any extra slacks, but not also giving any extra, um, not giving any extra um, compensation in a positive way. Basically, what we want, what we want to aim for, is honesty as much as possible. This action gets this result. Period. And we can get right back to positive afterwards because we only have. To, that's the good part about the timing principle is we only have to do this for the one point three seconds that we're doing. And if you you obviously don't have to time that. That's just one of those things that you can kind of guess at. Um, so if they do something and then we continue to obstruct, then the dog goes, oh, okay, that's something that they don't want. And so once we have those three principles down, plus a couple of body language things that we can continue to uh, use to encourage the dog, I, I think we, whenever we were doing the evaluation, we went over um, claiming a little bit, the claiming principle. Did, I think so. Um, it's pretty simple. If I want the dog to leave alone the trash can, can put the trash can here for an example. If I want the dog to leave alone the trash can, I will put the trash can behind me and I will face this dog who you can tell, even though, <laughs> see, how, see how effective that is? Mm -hmm. She said, oh, geez, I didn't realize you want me to stay away from this trash can. And I don't know why, but you do, obviously, because I, use my body language mm -hmm. to say the thing that my brain wants to say right. you know that my mouth wants to say and dogs always do that and they read it so much better than we do and so whenever we just take a page out of their book and start communicating in the way that they communicate they understand it just like that and it works very quickly do you need to that's his phone okay he never answers it so that right there is a huge principle and probably one of the biggest things that I teach you in this situation because you can take, you can get almost any behavior understood. Like I want him, I want him to leave Dave alone. And so I will come in here and I will claim Dave. Yeah. And I will focus on whoever it is. Because you notice they're not moving away, mm -hmm. but he is. And the only difference is, is where my eyes are pointing. Mm -hmm. And where my shoulders are pointing, you know, because my shoulders are pretty point forward out. And he's just like, oh, I don't understand, but he obviously wants me to stay away from, you know, from that guy. And I don't, but just yeah, as an example. Right, right. But you see how I had, I came in and went the extra mile to get into this space mm -hmm. and be extra clear with it. And then he got it right away. And there was no confusion or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Now you can do the same thing with an implement. Is you can put the implement in between. And that's a smaller version of the same thing. Whereas if I came all the way in here, he becomes it becomes clear. He gets more space. And we do that in a little short bursts, and we can just continue to communicate with our dogs on a regular basis. Now you add in the tools that we need to have security when the dog gets too excited, mm -hmm. so that we can actually have some sort of restraint on the dog without having to give it positive physical affection mm -hmm. and then we just start introducing it to the dogs and let the dog have let the dog make some decisions you know because even right now he wants to get back to you but he's very willing to not do that so that he doesn't have to be at the end of the collar because the collar is unpleasant in a, mm -hmm. to a degree but it's not so unpleasant that it, that it really is going to cause him any distress and so this allows us to stand very firm keep our energy nice and solid and calm even if he gets excited. So if he gets excited and runs to the end of the leash, all I have to do is just continue to hold on to the leash and then he'll get the bad end of it. He'll get the negative reinforcement. And I can stand here calmly and show him that I didn't even have to be, I didn't even have to get excited to be able to stop him from that. And I can start to lead with my energy. The dominant animal is the one whose energy everybody goes to. You know, if um, you got a, you know, you got, 
young, you know, younger, you got the grandkids or something like that that come over and you guys have tend to have a very calm energy. You will, the, the kids will still have some energy, but you will tend to find that their energy will be, oh, excuse me. their energy will be less in your house than at the playground because at the playground, everybody's trying to have high energy, but at your living room, you guys are trying to be very relaxed. And so therefore they, because you are the leaders, will follow your energy. They'll, they'll start to uh, um, move towards your energy. And so we want to be able to do that for our dogs. And we can't do that if we're struggling to keep them under control. You know, if we have to get excited in order to keep them under control, then we can't help them with our energy. So all we have to do is just hold on, stand there, and then whenever they have a problem with something, then I can just step in and say, hey, no, that dog is fine. I'll turn my back to it to let it know I'm not worried about that dog. You're the one who's causing issues. And then whenever they calm down and take a more neutral stance, then I can, then I can give positive physical affection to that mm -hmm. energy, you know, especially with petting. Because I can tell them that whenever you calm down, that's what I want. And so by continuously having that whole positive and negative conversation all day, every day, essentially, you know, every time that there's a situation, you just have the communication in that moment and then get through it and move on, then you end up having the ability for the dog to start to understand what you want on the long term. Because they can't understand long term if things happen repeatedly. You know, their, their brain is set up to remember all of these different things. And so we just want to create situations to where the dog can experience something new. And, the, and then we can tell it how to handle it. And then we expose it to them again. And then the next time, if they handle it even better, then they get extra reward or they get extra affection. Um, and they come to find out that handling this thing properly leads my life to an even greater place than it does being defensive. And then, and then I mean, like, then it's just a healing process going forward. So um, one of the ways that, one of the things that will get in the way is, is if the dog doesn't have any respect for us. You know, like if the dog is just, like if the dog thinks about us as their bone that they're protecting, that's a bad situation and so we'll generally do the walking the you know teaching them some exercises and things like that and making them do things for our resources which puts us in a, in a more dominant position and then the dog tends to say okay well you obviously are in charge because i i can't go where i want to go if you don't want to go there i can't get the things from you that i want to get from you if you don't want to give them to me so therefore you obviously are in charge and then once you have that dominance thing settled, then, then after that, the dog has the tendency to look to you for the guidance. Um, and this all sounds very complicated, and it's not one of those things that you have to remember every single word. It's just good to have the theory mm -hmm. together. So after that, what we would do is we would just start teaching, teaching some exercises to the dog, making sure that it understands. Does, I mean, does he do anything on command? For you at this point in time or any of them he really. sits <laughs> he sits so a lot of the things that we want to deal with is, is we want to, we want to talk about respect and respect in the animal kingdom is space if you respect something he, he might need out yeah. Rest, uh winston rusty you stay how about you Bob? not standing right here and we do that by just simply adding a word to it good for positive behaviors and no for negative behaviors making it very 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 simple like that if i don't want a dog to do something i tell it no and that doesn't mean it's bad it doesn't mean i hate it. it doesn't mean it's insufficient as a being or that it you know it's worthless or any of those ne negative connotations because i know that some people get really stirred up if you tell them no these days and they think that it means so much more than it does it just means that's not what i want right now and so if we start to be able to say no towards positive things. Are the hot dogs in here? Or are they out in the car? Oh, I don't think I have them on me. I have some hot dogs. Well, I got some cut up for the, for the lesson. Actually, I might run out real quick. And but, like for instance, if we I can had, go get them. If we had, do you mind? No, that's, my, um, that's why I'm here, right? <laughs> Hey, that actually works pretty good. There you go. Cool. 
So if I don't so want him to follow, can I get you? <laughs> what? You going this way? Yeah. Nope. Right. So just like that, I say no. I give him some instruction, and I prevent him. And then by that, you know, measure, the dog will start to understand that when I say no, I'm going to prevent. And so it gets later on to where whenever I say no, the dog understands that I'm about to prevent them and they can start to prevent themselves, which is just obedience. You know, I mean, like, that's exactly it. If, if I want him to not mess with something and I go, nope, I don't want him to not be focused on it, then I can do that. And, and as long as he quits the focus, then I, then I relieve the pressure. You know, and the, we do those things in good timing so that they can understand. Um, but we, if we attach that negative marker to the word, then we get to the point where we just start talking to our dogs. And, and, they, and they understand. And that even goes as far as, you know, even whenever there's about to be a dog fight. You know, because, I mean, Cinch is a, is a great dog and he's got a lot of training on him. But, I mean, he's been in fights before. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been attacked before. I've taken him on all, all, like, most of my aggression, my dog aggressive situations and everything because I can trust him. Because if I do say no, by and large, you know, he understands what that means. And so he can, he can understand that I don't, that's not what I want him to get into. He also understands that dad will protect him if something goes poorly, you know, that by following me, he earns my protection. Mm -hmm. Nope. Good boy. We ended up getting one of those bug spray things too. Oh, they're nope. great. Hot diggity. Hot diggity. So, we can go ahead and make a bunch of. Nope. A bunch of good smell. Nope. And then we can start to claim. Nope. The situation. Now, by putting this temptation here. It gives us the opportunity to get that no word in several times because they're going to be drawn towards it and they're going to push towards it mm -hmm. a bunch. But if I stand here and claim it, look at how much respect the dogs are getting. Oh, given. Yeah. They're giving them tons of space. And so we can use little exercises like this. The same thing that we do in the feeding process is I can say, you know, hey, here's the, I'm going to pour the bowl of food down, but you need to leave it alone um, for now. And then I can turn them loose to it later. But that's good practice for, you know, paying attention, following the leader, and just because something's there doesn't mean it's mine. You know, and then it can be mine whenever the leader decides to give it to me. And so, but you can see we get to the point where uh, where no is really all we need. And once we've communicated it, we don't have to sit here and really monitor over it that much because the dog understands clearly that I don't want them to have it. See? And it, and it doesn't take much. No. It just takes good dog communication. You know, like communicating like a dog. Um, uh, Dave's learning Japanese right now. And if he wanted to come and give this exact same words to me, uh, you know, exact same words to you and teach you all of these same things, but he did it in Japanese, it would be utterly ineffective. Mm. Yeah. See that? Yeah. That's how you say no. Yeah. Yeah. See, he, he knows that he could get it, mm -hmm. but he knows that it's mine now mm -hmm. because I've given him that nonverbal signal. Nope. And then, then we attach the verbal signal to it, and he can, and then we can make that communication very easily. And that, surprisingly enough, becomes something that becomes so instinctual and so clear that so instinctual and so clear that we can start to do it. Then we can do it in situations where it's a little bit more intense, mm -hmm. but we got to build up to it. We don't just go straight, <coughs> straight for it and expect it to work the first time. So, um, so that's basically it. When you have the claiming principle, you know how to reward, you know how to dissuade, and you have the tools you need to be able to do that with little effort, then it's just a bunch of rinse and repeat, go experience some things and express to the dog non-verbally how you want them to handle it. Mm -hmm. 
you express to them, hey, this is not a problem. It's obviously not a problem because I just turned my back to it. And an animal doesn't turn its back to something that it's afraid of in nature. It just doesn't happen, right. period. So if I turn my back to something else, all the animals that are in my charge understand that I'm not worried about that thing. And then they tend to be like, oh, okay, well, if, it, if the big guy's not worried about it, then I guess maybe I shouldn't be worried about it too. Mm -hmm. And then they'll tend to think about it differently, and therefore they, we can start to teach them more important lessons like dogs in general are not something that need to be fought with because I don't get stirred up about them. You know, you don't just wander around fighting things all the time for no reason. There's always a reason. It's because I feel threatened by it. And so if I continue to show it that I'm not threatened by it, then the dog will go, okay, well, you're stronger than me and you're not threatened by it, so therefore it must be okay. You know, and if it's not okay, you'll protect me because you're stronger than me. And then and then we just rinse and repeat this, this pattern over and over again and try to make sure that we communicate each individual issue. If the dog walks in the yard from somewhere else, then that is still something that I don't want you to get stirred up about. Now, one of these days, the dog will walk in the yard whenever we're not here, and the dog will tell it to go away, and then the dog will go away, and we will not correct it for it, and so the dog will be like, oh, okay, I can, I can do this when mom and dad aren't here. I can keep people away from the, from the situation when mom and dad aren't here, and I never get corrected for that. That's the same reason that the little dogs always poop behind the, the couches, and in the back rooms and everything like that is because they, they go in there and they do their business way far away, trying to be polite, and nobody ever corrects them in that moment. Now, sometimes they might be laying on the couch and somebody will pick them up and drag them over to the poop and correct them with it, but they don't ever understand. That it. Well, they can eventually, but it takes a long time to understand that I only get corrected when there's poop in the house and I can prevent it from getting there. And then you might... You might get corrected hundreds and hundreds of times, and it's just not fair to the dog. Okay. But so we can use that idea just the same with the dog to let it know what it is allowed to do. So if it's allowed to do something when we're not here, and we're not here, and it goes ahead and does it anyway, it will find out that there is no correction, and so therefore it will assume that, hey, I can protect myself when mom and dad are here. But when mom and dad are here, I need to defer to them and let them decide whether or not whether or not I'm going to, you know, we're going to have a problem here, you know, and, and you will pretty much always say, no, we're not going to have a problem unless it actually becomes one. And then when it does, then the dog will still protect you because you're a dog, you know, once that instinct is in place, you can't get rid of it entirely, but you can learn to teach them to control it. So, all this make pretty good sense? Do you have any questions? I know it's a lot of words, and um, it's a lot of... Not right now, no. No? So, basically, what we do from here on is we just start teaching some exercises. We get in good habits as far as the, the feeding and the containment. You know, it seems like this room is the dog room in general. Mm -hmm. and this yeah, is the, they don't get fed in here. We feed him and Winston. And they're pretty good. I mean, we put the food down, and they eat it whenever they want to. Yeah. They don't gorge on it or anything right um now i will say um there is some psychological some good psychological and leadership things that happen with one you know like with specific time feeding mm -hmm. as opposed to free feeding and, and I, I tend to prefer to have actual feeding events as opposed to just hey come and get it whenever you feel like it there's also health benefits to it as well you know, the whole feasting, Yeah, I mean, we put it cycling. down every day at the same time. Right. Morning and evening. Mm -hmm. And um, Winston, he used to just devour it. Right. He's always been, a, he's always been, a, okay, I'll eat as much as I want. Right. But, and they're eating more now that it's winter time, so they're eating it faster. In the summer is really when they... Yeah. Say, oh, I'll eat it later. Under under all circumstances, it's not super critical. Um, but whenever it comes down to um, the leadership factor, controlling the resource of food, mm -hmm. um, if the food is left and, and disregarded, then the dog has the only the only thing the dog can assume is is that the food is free game mm -hmm. and it's not being controlled by the the person in charge. And that's a normal thing. Um, it 
it might be a little bit of a missed opportunity, but if you guys, if that's the way you guys live your life, there's not going to be a huge big issue with that, mm -hmm. you know, as far as free feeding goes. Now, one of the things that we will want to do is, is we want to control doors. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's an important deal, and you can do it as simply as going in and out here. You know, whenever you decide to go in and out here, you can say, hey, no, no, you're not coming in, and that's a, every one of those is an opportunity to reinforce the no word. Okay. Um, same thing with the door. Doors are an opportunity to reinforce the no word. We eventually use the walking as a way to reinforce the no word because I'll say walk, and whenever I, whenever I say walk and he doesn't move with me, then he'll hit the end of the leash. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm hitting, making it. I'm not pulling on the end of the leash. Right. I'm just moving, mm -hmm. right? So I say walk, and he starts to learn that whenever I say walk, you better move, otherwise he hits the end of this leash. And whenever he's not paying attention, I say nope. And he gets to learn that whenever I say no, he needs to look to me and get back to, you know, that good walking position. And that's something we'll do more of outside. But then we, that's another opportunity to institute our nose. And so that word, if we use it the same word for everything it is that we don't want them to do, then it becomes really easy for them to understand and pick up. And when they hear it, they'll have a more, um, I suppose, more primal, more base trying to think of what kind of word I want to use a deeper reaction to it yeah it'll be less intense but it'll be deeper you know because like if, if I'm like I'm using a whole bunch of words right now and if I use words that people are generally less familiar with um, then they don't have as much of an impact whereas where if I use words that people are familiar with then it has more of an impact um, and, and it's understood more fully and so if we use the no all the time, then we get to, un the, the dog can understand a clearer version of what no actually means if we're consistent, you know? So if everything that I just don't want them to do gets a no and some sort of a prevention, then the dog learns that whatever it is that I'm focused on in this moment, if they say no, I need to quit, I need to stop focusing on it. Or, if I say no, they need to look back at me and check in with me to see what, to, to figure out what it is I want them to do next. And then you end up having this great nonverbal communication. And it all comes from using just one word and not, not adding so many different words into the situation. So we'll, we'll work on that today. And then after that, it's just a matter of exposure. We want to make sure that we teach some exercises and um, this isn't something I'm going to get super um, like serious with uh, about going in detail with but you want to be able to be it, add new exercises on and those you don't you don't need a trainer for that it's a simple formula and you can you can just rinse and repeat it and mm -hmm. continue to do it until the dog is familiar with it and then it's done um, and it doesn't require anything real fancy um, so when somebody tries to sell you their supervision over teaching a dog how to lay down, don't buy it. Just <laughs> you can watch them. You can you can watch my videos as many times as you want, and you'll you'll it has all the information that you could ever want in there. Come. We want a dog to come to us. We move away. Sit. We want a dog to sit. We generally, can bait above the head. Good. There you go. Come. And then sit. Good. You see, it's a patience game. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not... Right. I'm not saying, go, mm -hmm. sit, 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 That doesn't do any good. Oh, I dropped it. You'll find it, I'm sure. That's what you're built for. You may have already found it. And it bounced over here. Oh. Well, maybe she'll, <laughs> maybe she'll find it. She'll find it. She's using her nose. Can you find it? They brought in a lot of leaves again. Right. <laughs> they get on her tail. So, um, but if you can, if you know what's going to work, you know. Good. See, I waited. Mm -hmm. I let him think, like, oh, I'm, I'm a, should I do this? Should I do that? And everything. And then he finally got the courage up and decided to put his butt down. Then, and whenever he did put his butt down, that that waiting, the 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 
um, the pause mm -hmm. and the anticipation draws a different picture because I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting for you to do it right. And then as soon as the thing happens, then boom, you did it right. And so he learns that whenever he's holding a treat up above my head like this, <laughs> like the dog might try to jump. And if it does, I will give it a negative, which will be just taking the food farther away. Mm -hmm. He sit. So normally she won't take food out of your hand. Sit. She never has. So up and back is usually the answer with food. Well, this is a hot dog though. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You sit. Good. So right. even when she did it accidentally, I still give the reward. Right. That's that's the key whenever you're teaching exercises. Accidental successes are successes. Because once I give this food, it becomes dopamine. And dopamine helps them to remember the action. So even if they did it by accident, mm -hmm. I'm priming their brain to remember that action. Right. You know, because the bigger the piece of the bigger the dopamine hit in your brain, the longer back it'll cause you to remember. So um, if it's just a little tiny piece of something that just goes, hmm, that's good, you know, then it will only remember just a few seconds beforehand. So, come. Sit. Good. And then I use good timing, but as soon as the butt hits the ground, as soon as he's fully completed the thing, then I just say good, and then give him a treat. Now, it's really important that whenever we're marking these things, that we're marking uh, behaviors. Rusty, good. So you see, whenever I said good, I was not already moving. Because mm -hmm. if I go good, that the the start of the chain of events that leads to him getting the treat is my motion. And so everything else, all of the different sounds that are out there, that is, the, those are all background noises. Dogs learn nose, eyes, ears in that order. So if the eyes have taken over, the ears don't matter. So what I need to do is, is I need to address the ears first. And so I'll say, good, then move. Because when I say good, it addresses the ears, which is the hardest for them. And then whenever I move, it addresses the eyes. And then the nose is always going no matter what, you know, because it's, well, actually that's not true. Uh, the, the nose isn't always going because the nose will shut off at some points when the dogs get too stressed. Mm -hmm. And they will only use their eyes because that's a survival mechanism. So, but we don't worry about the nose. Um, at this point. The nose is something that's so complicated that all we need to know is whether or not they're using it or not. And if they're not using it, something's wrong. So, uh, so if you want to teach an exercise like it down, you just get some more fuel, get some more uh, ammo here. Nope. Oxy, you don't need Good boy. This. So, do you see how that happened? He was nosing in on the treats. Oh. I said no. I made a little snap. Which the snap was the correction, incidentally enough. I said no, and then I did something sharp, startled him. And that's enough correction sometimes for a dog. It's like it doesn't really have to be like I'm punching dogs in the face or mm -hmm. anything like that. Like if they're biting me in the leg, then sure I will. You know, because I'm not an idiot and I need my leg. But whenever it comes down to it, is we want to use the minimal necessary force. Now if the snap hadn't worked, then I would need to continue to become stronger and stronger with my correction but you do whatever works and as soon as it works then you've won and you give up right you ain't mad like if you have a dog that runs away and you try a whole bunch of different things to get it to come back and it takes a half hour to get the dog to come back whenever it comes back to you you can't be mad at it anymore because the dog is doing what you want what you want now mm -hmm. and they live in that moment so they're thinking oh I've come to them and now they're angry with me so oh, well, I'm not gonna yeah. come to them next time so Anyway, that's just a little side note. So if I want to get him to lay down, I tend to hold my treats in a very specific way. Okay. I use my hand as a shield, because mm -hmm. whenever that happens, I can steer the dog in all these different directions. And I can also prevent, you know, if I got a dog that jumps, that lunges at treats mm -hmm. and everything, a lot of times this is what it'll do. Because they won't bite my hand, they just want the treat that's in my hand. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna go through my hand to get the treat, and I like that. If you have that problem, you, you, you're not trying to give dog tre dogs treats at that point. You know, you've already called the trainer and <laughs> or the vet, one of the two, because that's just too much. Right. You know, and I, I don't, 
I hope they call it the trainer. So whenever I want to do the down, what I can do is, is I can take my hand and get them right here, and then I can put good. I can put my hand upside down like that, mm -hmm. to where in order for them to get their nose to it, they have to go down further. Oh, gotcha. And yeah. then they can put. You sit. You sit. Sometimes you got to be a little bit more deliberate with a dog that's hesitant, Almost like her. Sit. <laughs> Good. There you go. Here's a big piece. You want to lay down? Now, some dogs are not as driven towards food, so food mm -hmm. works less. Mm -hmm. Down. Do you see how I'm, by me getting lower, I'm causing her to have to get all the way up on me. It's a little closer to the front of my hand, so I might use that down. And then I just wait. Now, if she doesn't down, I'm not going to give her the treat. Okay. Like some people will do that, and they'll mm -hmm. just be like, oh, you tried. No, it's one to one ratio. When you do it right, you get a reward. If you don't do it right, you don't get a reward. Mm -hmm. If you do something wrong, you get the correction. Down. So it's all about patience. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not we're not doing that. And so if I'm standing here holding their attention for long periods of time because I've got the nifty little treat that they really, really, really want and everything, that's dominance. And that's where having a bowl of cookies or whatever it is still puts you in the dominant position even if you're not being physical in nature and aggressive in nature with the dog. Mm -hmm. But if it gets to the point where the food doesn't matter to them, then chances are you're catering to them too much. You, they, they've got too much food. So, down. Good. So we, we're really careful that we say good, then move. That's hugely important. Seems like the tiniest detail. Mm -hmm. Really, really important. Good. So, what's this one saying? Foxy. Foxy. In wrestling. So, Foxy, good. So what I can do is, is I, I can start a real simple game where I tell, I say the dog's name, the dog looks at me, and therefore it wins. Because that's all I want. If I say a name, I want a dog to look at me. Mm -hmm. Right? So, if, it, and now if they continue to look at me, I get to continue to reward them. Because generally, if I say the dog's name, I want them to maintain some contact with me. So, good. And then that gives me the opportunity to sit here and be good. I'm going to get little big pieces for you, because you're a little big guy. Good. And I can practice saying, then moving. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, because if you start moving before you say, the word becomes just background noise, just like the birds chirping or the TV mm -hmm. going or any of these other things that are happening while life happens. And they don't have to be, they don't have to be part of the process. So whenever we're dealing with that sort of thing, good. And you can break pieces down into the tiniest little bits. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, first of all, we don't want their bellies to get full to the point where they don't care, mm -hmm. and they get just as much dopamine from this tiny little piece mm -hmm. as they do from this little medium-sized piece, as they do from the bigger piece, as they do from an entire hot dog. Oh, okay. It, it doesn't change much at all. I mean, it changes a little bit, but nothing that's useful, you know, so we might as well give them the smallest amount that activates their dopamine mm -hmm. so that they can, so, so that we can do it multiple times, because it's more, it's more important to do repetition. So, good. And so you can see, at this point, I have plenty of command over the dogs just simply because I control resources. Just like the CEO of the company when he walks into the party, mm -hmm. everybody shuts up all of a sudden. You know, even though they've been having a good time, they're not stopping, you know, like nothing. It didn't stop them from having a good time, but he walks in and he wants to stand still in the middle of the room. Everybody will come to his energy because he's the one that controls all the resources, which happens to be the work, right. you know, or the money. So, anyway, these things are all the 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 way we look at it makes a big difference and so if i have resources that they want to continue to get and we go to a place where they have the stimulations that they want to avoid i can use the resource to bring them to and then use it to help them to be more positive while sitting in the presence of this thing that makes them anxious and eventually if you can sit in the presence of something that makes you anxious it'll stop making you anxious because your body can't continue to be very highly stressed for huge long periods of time.
and especially if the stimulation doesn't continue to re-offend. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. So, so what we want to do is just put him in the position where he gets to be around other dogs regularly, and now it can be a distance. It doesn't have to be directly in their space, although we want to continue to move towards that. Um, then, and, and we just want to be able to prevent the very bad thing from happening without us addressing it and making it better. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I if we were dealing with a new dog and he has like the other day when Cinch was here and he has a, a reaction to it, you saw that I gave him upward pressure, we stopped the situation, I chased the other dog off, which tells him that I'm protecting him. Mm -hmm. This is good news, you yeah. know, like, this is a good thing. And so I stopped him and I told the other dog that they need to bugger off and you know <laughs> stop messing with my dog mm -hmm. and th and then we become calm again then you know that that is actually a good interaction it's not that we want to prevent him from ever getting to the state of anger we want to teach him what to do whenever he gets into that state of anger mm -hmm. and the answer will be if you act aggressive things will get worse for you if you stay calm if you handle your anger internally and stay calm then Things will get better for you, and you will actually get rewards. Present, good. And then we can add positivity to the situation. And so it's just a bunch of little micro discussions, and then we just do it again. And if he does better the next time, then he skips the correction and goes straight to the reward. And then he did it again. He skips the correction straight to the reward. And now every time he sees the dog, he's just like, "Oh, this is an opportunity for another hot dog." And I'm not really worried about him because I've got upset a few times, and the only person that causes me any problems is my owner. And it's only whenever I get upset. So I'll just sit here and pay attention. And, oh, yep, there's that hot dog that I, that I thought I was going to get. So now, new dog means hot dog. <laughs> and then you can do that until they get to the point where they're comfortable enough to let them get a sniff. You know, and then start having some, some discussion between each other. And then eventually they'll get to the point where they can start playing. And then you have, you integrate one. One dog, two dog, three dogs, and then you get to the point where the dog sees another dog, and instead of thinking hot dog, they think play. Mm -hmm. And so either way, is the dog has become a positive thing as opposed to becoming a negative thing. And now, key, keep them away from dogs that are that are going to make this situation worse. Keep them away from dogs that are going that are unstable and are going to create fights. But most dogs aren't. Mm -hmm. Most dogs, if they get a chance to sniff, oh yeah, they'll come in and they'll and that's okay, I, I understand you now, and then, boom, everybody everybody either minds their own business or goes to play, but fights generally don't have it, right. unless the dog's in balance. And if you need dogs that are balanced in order to be able to expose them to a, a controlled group of dogs, then, you know, then we, can, we can talk about maybe getting them together with more of my dogs. You know, I've, I've got two, but, you know, I also have a whole bunch of them that I work with on a regular basis and maybe we can get a group meet together and that won't have to cost anybody any extra it'll just be a an event mm -hmm. where we can just get together for some socialization or something like that and i can talk you through that process mm -hmm. or if you want to go to a dog park and test it out then we can do that later so cool so that's all of the jabbering that i have to do okay. so I'm what was the I, name of that brindle one that we met friday oh blue yeah, blue. Yeah, blues. He needs socialization bad too. Yeah, well, um, yeah, and we've already started working on that. And uh, but blue was in a, such a bad situation where he couldn't even be around other people, so he couldn't, you know, he couldn't even be around a, a trainer without having issue. And so we had to fix that problem first before we can move to socialization. But blues in in the right realm where socialization is the next step, which that uh, I believe is, is Friday. So, um, this is going, in, uh, going to the park with Blue. So, that's we're going to take him to the park? Huh? We're going to take him to the park? Yeah, well, we've already taken him to the park once, but we didn't turn him loose in the dog park yet. Um, so we, we're going to continue to try to step away. But, cool. Um, so, after that, it's just a matter of getting some more exposure and showing you how to handle the situation, and I'm going to let you start to handle it. Okay. Um, if um, if we need to address the prong collar situation, then we can do that. Okay. Um, it's not a horrible idea to look into e-collars. 
I don't provide those because they're they're expensive. Yeah, yeah. I mean you can spend as much as you're spending on this whole program on an e calendar if you're careful. If you're not mm -hmm. careful. But um, this should be fine if you feel comfortable with the physical the physicality yes. of it of like I can actually put enough upward pressure to get the dog to stop doing what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you feel comfortable with that, then there's this collar will get you wherever it is you need to go. Mm -hmm. If you need to add the electricity to the situation, um, I don't have any problem with that. I personally think it's very clear to the dog. It's not, though, the step that you start with. The dog needs to understand what you want first, and then you correct it whenever it's willingly, knowingly doing something that it's not supposed to do, mm -hmm. because um, e-collars are not directional. This thing, if I move this way, he understands to move which way to move. Mm -hmm. That's why prong collars are such a better tool for teaching. This is because it gives me the ability to, as gently as humanly possible, mm -hmm. get good compliance from the dog without offending him or me or anybody else. And I don't have to be super strong to do it because the dog gives as soon as there's the smallest amount of pressure. And he doesn't. He, he doesn't have the wherewithal to pull against it that hard. And most dogs don't. So, cool. Okay, so my cold on where we go. Yeah, that's fine. Time? Actually, if you don't mind, I'm, uh, I would like to use the restroom uh, before we go further. And since this is a longer lesson, if it comes to the point where you need to take a break or do something, so why don't we take a 10 minute break and, okay. uh, and then we'll check back in uh, here in 10 minutes. Okay. Or just come out and meet us in, in about 10 minutes and then, uh, and then we'll, get, fin we'll okay. get working on the next bit. Yeah. Because restroom it's, is down hall. Okay, excellent. All right, so I guess uh, to the van. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. You can. I mean, it's just you can take a break for a minute. And then All right, cool. We'll be out in the driveway just like we were. All right. The other day. Cool. So walking is one of the most important things when it comes to the psychology of the dog and, and who's in charge because um, <coughs> dogs, so Cinch who has had thousands of hours worth of dog training on him is just now getting to the point to where he can understand that he can be out front and I'm still leading. And that's after thousands of hours essentially. Um, and so it's not an easy concept for dogs to understand. Can they? Yes, they can, but it's not something that they get. So with the average dog and any dog you're going to come across, and most of the time any dog that you're going to have throughout the course of your entire life, if it's not like a herding type dog, they're not going to be able to understand that they're out front, but you're still leading. So whenever we do our walking, it's very important. And we started doing this the other day in the evaluation is when we walk. You notice, I said walk and he hopped up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of those things that we use as a cue. So if I'm going to start walking, what I'll do is I'll give him a certain amount of leash and everything, and I'll say walk, and then I'll move. And he notices that walk comes before me leaving away. And if I leave away, he'll hit the end of the leash. Walk. So you see a little bit quicker movement. Mm -hmm. Good boy. So I can tell him good. Sit. Good. And we can add positivity to the situation if he's not, you know, if he's willing to take it. If he's not willing to take it, that tells us something. If a dog won't take food, then a lot of times that means that they're very anxious. So, um, but we can add, but whenever he gets calmed down enough about the situation that, um, that he'll take food, it's a good thing to be able to add that positivity to the process that also has the negative involved with it. So walk. So whenever I say walk and he moves with me, good boy. Then he, then he doesn't hit the end of the leash. So it's basic cause and effect. And dogs thinking cause and effect. So as long as I'm out front and I'm determining our direction. Nope. Good boy. As long as I'm out front and I'm determining our direction that he doesn't have any other choice but to assume that I'm the leader. And so but vice versa, if he's out front and he's determining our direction, then he doesn't have any choice but to assume that he's the leader. 
And the leader position comes with a responsibility. And dogs don't have to be taught this. It just comes. It just comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. um, is if I if he's leading, then it's his job to look out for danger and to decide when we're going to fight. And those are both decisions that I need to be doing. Those are both responsibilities and burdens that need to be on me, not on him, because I come with two extra layers of brain that can abstract things and they can understand that when the mail guy comes and drop something off in the mailbox that he's going to be leaving every single time. The dog can't really understand that. So the guy comes and opens up the mailbox, the dog barks at him, and then he leaves. The dog thinks that I barked at him and he left, which tells a couple, tells him a couple things. Number one, my barking gets people to go away. My aggressive presentation gets people to go away. And number two, if they do run away, then chances are they're a slinky, weaselly type of character that should not be in my yard in the first place. And we know that none of that's true. Like, that's a whole narrative that they have in their brain that we understand is not true. And that's why we need to be the one to make the decision to say, no, you're not allowed to bark at the mailman because he's here to do us a service. You know, he's here, he's actually here as a, as a friend, as a, you know, as a, uh, as a kindness to us. So, come. Good. So, we want to have that position. So when I say walk, good boy. What a good dog. Hey. I want him to understand that when I say walk, I'm moving. It's not, I'm not saying it to ask you if you're coming along. I'm not negotiating with you. I'm not saying, hey, if you'll, if you'll move with me, then we'll move. Because that puts him in charge. He's determining the direction, the speed, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. When I say walk, I'm leaving. Walk. And it's a kindness to him to let him know that he'll he'll hit the end of the, the leash if he doesn't move with. So, good boy. Walk. And then through repetition, he finds out that every time I move with this guy, I get hot dogs, everything turns out great, and I don't hit the end of the leash. Nope. When I say nope, that means you're doing something I don't want you to do, which is just going a different direction. So he's got to turn around check in with me to figure out which direction I'm going. And that imprints in their brain. It becomes very subconscious that whenever I say no, he needs to check. He needs to check in with me and figure out what it is that I want. Good, good boy. Good boy. Yeah. And whenever I like his energy, physical affection is the thing. Although I generally, whenever we're doing a little working session like this, I tend to save physical affection for after the work. Because uh, because it, it, it's just a it's an opportunity to get them to work harder for that physical affection because in addition to energy physical affection also says I like the state that you're in which are both like they both can be the same thing you know because the state that you're in could also be your energy but the state of obedience might be a, a different from your energy like you could be excitedly obedient or you could be relaxed obedient or you could be any anywhere in between and so but you can tell you can tell them that I'm happy with what it is that you're being by by petting and that's that's where we want to keep that in mind that that's what that's going to communicate so if you pet them for doing an action they're going to assume that you're petting them for this their state of being whatever that happens to be you know and that can be a, a bunch of different things but if you think about it as state of being well, good boy then you end up having a greater accuracy in communication with the dog nope and so my no becomes something else it also becomes the warning for him it's like i'm not correcting him. Nope. i'm not correcting him he's correcting himself nope and if I say nope and he fixes it, then he doesn't get the correction. And so it's not that I'm yanking on the collar mm -hmm. or anything, it's, and I'm not necessarily being the disciplinarian. I'm just putting him in scenarios and giving him guidance as to how to get through them the best way possible. And so therefore that changes the context of, you know, I become so strong that I don't even have to discipline the dog. I can just warn them and then let life happen and then they'll end up figuring it out. And that's a good position to be in because if the dog think the the more the dog thinks you are, 
the better it's going to listen to you and the better that you can serve it by keeping it out of trouble and teaching it how to deal with different situations. But if the dog doesn't trust you and doesn't think that you're way up here, then it might not feel that it's, it's a good idea still to expose itself to a danger, what it perceives as a danger, without, you know, without defending itself. You know, because it's like, okay, well, it's like it was the whole example of stopping a fight to, to get a dollar bill. It's not going to happen because the dollar bill is great. Everything now. If somebody says I'll give you ten thousand dollars to stop fighting, I'll stop fighting right away. Sure. It's like whatever this guy did that has got me fighting him. I'm not. I'm not ten thousand dollars concerned with it. You know. I mean, unless it's worse than that, and then the price goes up. But so that's the that's the same thing. Is is we want to have enough authority over the situation for the dog to go. It doesn't matter what's happening around. I need to pay attention to my owner because they're the ultimate. You know. So walk. And it, you end up having a good time with, you know, these dogs that are kind of lazy, you know, because he's, he's a little bit lazy. And so you don't end up having to work too hard to get them to put themselves out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. When their comfort zone is that specific. Sit. Feel it. When their comfort zone is that specific, you don't have to work, you don't have to put a lot of energy into getting them out of that. But if they will exit their comfort zone just on your words, then you know that we're having obedience, you know, uh, because it's not obedience if, it, if it's just always doing the things that you want to do. That's why the positive only training thing is kind of a myth, mm -hmm. is if the dog is only doing something because it feels like it's worthwhile, because it's going to get something out of it, then it's not, it's not really obeying, it's just taking advantage, you know, if, if it's, it, so we need to have the negative balance in that situation. Well, so after the first little bit where we get the opportunity to positively reinforce a couple times an action, the action of staying in this position, you end up having a really good walk. Walk stays behind because if he gets out in front of me and like say we start to walk back towards you and he gets excited and wants to go ahead of me, then I'll, as soon as he crosses that plane where he's ahead of me, I'll stop and turn around, tell him nope. And I use nope because you can't get angry at somebody when you're saying nope, <laughs> you know. So, like, if you say no, so you can get angry. If you say nope, you, you, your brain can't seem to do both things at the same time. So, if he were to get ahead, I would just say nope, and I would turn. And then he would hear that and know that it's important to pay attention and move with me. So, we can end up doing that in the presence of dogs. Is, like, you go to a dog park. And you can do these walking routines and let the dogs get right up on the fence. They can even bark at the fence and all these different things. And you teach the dog that it's important to just pay attention to me. No matter what else is going around, we devalue all of the rest of that stuff by sitting in the presence of it and not reacting to it. Because if you, if you, uh, if you react to something, you're adding value in the dog's mind to it. You know, uh, if you don't react to it, you're devaluing it, and it can only go one way or the other. It doesn't. It, it doesn't really. It, the, things don't really remain static like that. So, did you get tuckered out already? We've been at this for like five minutes. <laughs> you got a bad hip, man. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> I hear you. So, that's going to be the idea. So, down. Good boy. So, shouldn't generally be petting for this whole situation but you can to a degree it just won't do as much good mm -hmm. and it'll be a little bit but I can pet for the state of obedience you know like a, a being obedient being uh, submissive to me and so if I tell him down and he does that and I pet him it's not a bad thing to pet in that situation it's just not as good as giving a food reward. Mm -hmm. so free so we want to add free as our as another one of our words so we've got good and no, and then we add free to the situation because we eventually get to the point where we can start to move and reward them for not moving. So the only way to do that, the best way to do that anyway, if you ask me, is, is I don't use the word stay at all. Um, what I do is I actually just give the command that I was going to give, and then I reward them for not getting up. So they automatically, their default answer is right, you know, 
and then I just have to get them into the situation where they will make a mistake once or twice and I say, no, that's not it. You don't get your reward this time. And then I put you back down and then I start to move away again. Oh, man. Uh-oh. Yeah, this is not... Do we want to do another day, maybe? <laughs> you know what? It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to um, just get a little bit of exposure to the dog again and then come back another day. Okay. Um, and, and we can just call it... We can call this a half lesson and then come back again. I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. If you want. Yeah. Um, so, let's take some time real quick, though, before, before we cut it loose mm -hmm. and, and let him get exposed to cinch again and give him a little bit better. You want to get that one off the ground? I also like to use a little command for finding food on the ground. You know, if he doesn't realize there's food there, I'll say find it, and then I'll just point at something. I'll show him to food, okay. and then eventually he'll get the understanding that if there's something on the ground that I want him to pick up, that I don't actually have to bend down and point it to it. I just say find it, and he'll be like, oh shoot, there's food. <laughs> I know what that word means. So anytime we want to teach a word to a dog, we say the word first, and then we show them what it means. Then they'll start to pick that up. Okay. So, just the same thing. Uh, Rusty. Good. That's that's task number one. Mm -hmm. You can work on that in the meantime. You just say the name. He looks at you. You say good, and then reward. Because if you can get your dog to stop and look at you in the presence of any sort of distraction, mm -hmm. and that becomes priority, then they get. To, then it's very easy to get in most situations in in line quickly. You just right. say, Rusty, good. And so Rusty also doesn't become a negative thing. It becomes, nope, nope, <laughs> nope. So again, I can, I can use the claiming principle just like I did right there. Mm -hmm. And even though it is a bunch of hot dogs, nope. You can also use the leash if you need to. Even though it's a bunch of hot dogs, he can't have them until I use the F-R-E-E -E word. And that's going to be the word that I use to say that you can go ahead and do the thing that you were trying to do. Now, so that gives me the ability to start to work on stay work mm -hmm. without him knowing anything about it. This is, I just installed this word called free. Free happens when we go through doors. Free happens whenever I release the food to you. And he's been a very good boy. Free. Good boy. And so he starts to realize that free means I can go ahead and do the thing that I wanted to do. And so what we do is, is we withhold that word in the presence of things that he wants, tell him to do a sit or a down or whatever it is, and he only gets rewarded for staying wherever he's at until we say free and then he can go get his reward. You know, and, and that's that's the that's the key right there. So the uh See if I can unleash the other beast. Hopefully he'll behave a little bit better. Okay. Did you leave the keys in there? I think my keys are in the car. Nope. So, same thing. Like if I was teaching him to stay in the car, I could say no. Uh -huh. And no just means that's not what I want you to do because he generally gets out of the car whenever a door opens. Right. If he doesn't, but dogs do. Yeah. Um, and so if I just say no, then that means that that you've done that. And so now I can I can go and I can actually reward him in that situation. Nope. For nope. For staying. And, uh, and then that is how I communicate to the dog that if, if you pay attention to what I'm asking you to do and you don't do the things that I'm telling you not to do, then you'll get rewarded for that as well. Mm -hmm. Very much for your work. <laughs> he's he heard you. He heard the words since he, since he's had so much work on him. He picks out lots of smaller words that uh -huh. other dogs won't, and that's fine. And and we don't have any problem. You mind putting these in your hoodie or something? So, all come down, down. So 
if he takes the position behind me, he's giving up to my authority. He's saying that I'm that that fine. I'll I'll do you know I'll let you take the lead, mm -hmm. which means that you get to decide when we fight, right? And so um, so that way we get the opportunity to move around the dog. Him give him plenty of space, and that's fine. Nope, down. I think you're going to for it. Down. You're all right, buddy. And so if we can just start getting in the presence of more animals, then then we can uh, end up, then we can end up letting this happen because this again has happened in a very calm way mm -hmm. now we're going to need to stretch it out and make it more difficult for him by coming in from a different direction Pitch, go to bed uh -oh. all right <laughs> yep i said that calls it i think they called it yeah. okay and then um i'll go ahead and come in with you